Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Cooper Hewitt's Smithsonian Design Museum's National Design Week. My name is Kim robledo -Diga. I'm here to welcome the Human Experience and Built Environment panel. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go ahead and tell you that National Design Week was started in 2006, and it's part of a week-long celebration celebrating our National Design Award winners. And during the week, the Education Department offers free programming throughout the week. This, week, this program day actually end caps our, day, our programming, um, celebrating the work and the vision of our winners. But none of this could be possible without the support of our funders. So National Design Awards programming is made possible by generous support from Target. Additional support is provided by Adobe. Funding is also provided by Design Within Reach, Altman Foundation, Facebook, Edward and Helen Hintz, and Siegel Family Endowment. I want to welcome my, my colleague, Matilda McQuaid, who is Deputy Curatorial Director, who will introduce our National Design Award winners on the panel today. Thanks, Kim, and welcome to everyone in this wonderful exhibition space. I hope you've all had a chance to see Senses or Will after this conversation. But I am thrilled to be here with four National Design Award winners. Um, they each, I think, have their, uh, their partners who aren't here. They were limited to one person on this panel, so we had, they had to fight for it. Um, to my left is John Christakos, and he represents Blue Dot, and he's the National Design Award winner for product design. Um, it, Blue Dot was founded in 1997 with Maurice Blanks and Charlie Laser, and it's based in Minneapolis. Um, Blue Dot designs and manufactures furniture that is useful, affordable, and brings good design to as many people as possible. Anne Spurn is the recipient of the 2018 National Design Award for Design Mind. She's an award-winning author, landscape architect, photographer, and the Cecil and Ida Green Distinguished Professor of Landscape Architecture, Architecture and Planning at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And then Michael Manfredi is, represents Weiss Manfredi, and he, he and Marianne Weiss, his partner, are the 2018 National Design Award winner for architecture design. Weiss Manfredi expands the territory of architecture by connecting landscape, art, infrastructure, and architecture, seamlessly fusing architecture and nature. And finally, last but not least, Chad Oppenheim represents Oppenheim Architecture and Design, and they are the 2018 National Design Award winner for interior design. They were founded in 1999, um, and they do architecture planning, an interior design firm specializing in hospitality, commercial mixed use, retail, and residential buildings worldwide. So that gives a little brief intro, and I think they'll get more into what they do and their um, ideas as we begin our discussion. And so I'm gonna begin, begin it with a question, and we're going to hopefully go in lots of different, um, along different paths, and we can change the topic entirely. You're free to ask questions of one another. But because the panel is about the human experience, I wanted to find out from you all, as people who deal with people, um, as users, what is the creative process that you go through um, when you are designing something for human experience, whether it's a building, whether it's a landscape, whether it's a piece of furniture. What is the first thing you might think about or sort of begin to research? Um, and then what leads you um, into kind of design development? And anyone can answer. Anne. <laughs> first. Um, so I write books um, and try to reach a large general audience with my books, but uh, I'm not an armchair theorist. I have to practice in order to generate theory and to test theory. So I am working with, uh, in general, uh, for the past 30 years with uh, people in inner city communities, in poor communities, primarily African-American, <clears throat> in West Philadelphia. And 
my process in working with them is uh, a process of co-creation, of co-mutual learning. Um, I learn from them, they learn from me, and together we come up with uh, something that none of, I wouldn't think of alone. Yeah, I actually, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to build on, uh, I think, the comment that Anne made, I, you have to start with a certain level of humility. Much of our work is in, even if it's institutional, it's in the public realm. And um, Mary and I and the folks in our office try to start with a kind of a, an attitude of knowing nothing, um, which sounds a little, um, in a way, contradictory, but we try to immerse ourselves with as much knowledge as we can, uh, as quickly as we can, and hopefully at the rate of a child. And then much of the interaction early on does happen with a community, and it's amazing how sophisticated folks who seemingly are unsophisticated actually are. And I think we're always surprised that there's always some little germ of an idea or concept that happens to come in from left field which really triggers a larger idea. To build on that, um, I was just talking about that this morning, the idea of childhood wonder and approaching things with kind of uh, innocence um, because we, we do so many different types of projects and so many different places. I find that it's interesting to be an outsider, um, that we're able to see things with fresh eyes and, and engage. And idea of, uh, and I think we can all probably speak about that, but it's a, it's a very arduous process that we put ourselves through, perhaps uh, not necessary, but we, we feel that if we don't go through this very uh, cathartic learning period, that we might have missed something, and, and we don't want to leave anything on the table. So that the same thing in terms of trying a lot of design ideas. It's a, you know, even if we have the right idea the first time, we have to try hundred others just to make sure that there's nothing better that we can think of. So it's uh, definitely a, a painful but rewarding process. I might add that um, we're a little different in the sense that um, you, re you have re responding to clients needs in a clients program and, and um, as product designers we're a little unique in the sense that we decided to start our uh, business along with designing. So we are kind of our own client. So. Um, we the, the hardest thing for us sometimes is deciding what to work on, you know, deciding what to what to make and what to add to our collection. So that's sort of step one, and then from there it's it's really a matter of um, optimizing. And it's fun. It's like problem solving, optimizing um, various constraints, whether it be you know function or you know really function. You know, can you is, is it easy to use? Is it is it easy to make? Is it sellable? Do people want it? Is it beautiful? Um, and trying to sort of, like a multivariable equation, try and get the most out of each of those things. And, you know, sometimes we're more successful than others, but. But how do you, in terms of determining, determining what we need? Um, I mean, I know with, you know, with Anne, I think you, when we were talking briefly um, last week, um, you know, there's a lot of observation that goes with, your research, and and I'm wondering for each of you if that same kind of thing happens. Are you looking at how people use design? Are you looking at other examples that, um, you know, whether they're popular or have some kind of special characteristic? Are you, how are you determining what we as consumers need? What is that based on? Um, I, I, sometimes we're inspired by um, sort of tried and true DIY pieces of design. So it's sort of this, uh, and the best example I can think of now is um, bookcases that we all had maybe in our college dorm rooms that were made out of, you know, plastic milk crates and planks. You know, that just stack them up yeah. right. and the flexibility of that and the just unbelievable directness of that. So 
I mean, that's in terms of observing, yes, you see, you see something like that out in the world that you know just works fundamentally. Um, and that might be a jumping off point for, it has been a jumping off point for actually a few of our designs. And in terms of observation, I mean, just, I know the camera pays, plays an important part in your research, too. Do you want to talk? For about me, uh, photography is a way of thinking, and the camera is an instrument of thought. Um, so I'm not going click, 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 and I'm really using the frame to zoom in uh, to find significance and to understand a place. Every place is in the process of becoming to uh, look for um, how to reveal the invisible through photography first and then through planning and design. Um, for example, like buried rivers. You know, in cities, we're walking on buried rivers all the time. And those buried rivers, you don't think, because you don't see them and acknowledge them, you think that maybe they have nothing to do with your daily life. But in fact, they're shaping the city and, and shaping lives. So uh, for me, it's important not only through photography but through design to reveal these invisible forces that, um, that under, either undermine or that support human life uh, in, in cities in particular. Yeah, I think in, in, in our case, um, you know, architecture is a, uh, kind of a funny art form in the sense that it, it often relies on clients. And we got a little frustrated with that. So we entered a number of competitions, um, two of which we were fortunate enough to win, but there was a social agenda to both of them. One was low cost housing here in New York, and the other was to rethink schools. And even though they were projects that never went ahead, I think part of it was something we discovered, which is the art of architecture, the art of design, whether it's landscape planning, does have a very profound effect on a larger population. And often we spend a lot of time talking to each other. Um, but we realized that this kind of potential was empowering and it, it made us really excited about trying to find work, either through competitions or clients, searching out clients, that had a strong social and public agenda. And I think it's crucial for design to kind of find the right conversation to engage in. And sometimes you have to initiate that yourself. So in terms of like your Hunter's Point project, which just the phase two was just completed recently. Right. So who, in terms of what was the, what was the challenge there? What was, or what was the, um, the agenda, kind of the criteria that you had to kind of, you know, kind of um, adhere to? Yeah, well, that, uh, that's a great question, Matilda. Uh, so this is a park on the East River opposite Roosevelt Island. It, actually, the first phase we started design 10 years ago. So these large urban projects, as Anne will attest, take a long time, which is both a challenge but also, I think, uh, an incredible opportunity. There, the Parks Department had very low standards. They wanted to create open space. I think that's pretty noble. But we were very interested in bringing a kind of um, uh, a more resilient narrative to the project. And at the time, we had this conversation earlier, it was surprising. This is 10 years ago. No one talked about potential uh, life-threatening storms. And um, everyone would say at the Parks Department and at city planning, a 100-year storm, a 200-year storm will never hit. And halfway through, or we were nearly finished with construction on phase one, that Sandy came. And as many of you know in this room, uh, the devastation was quite extraordinary. The park survived. There were a number of measures there that were seen as radical. So I think the idea there, uh, getting back to your question, Matilda, was to bring an agenda of resilience, which now I think everybody should be talking about, but uh, often they don't to a project. So you always have to bring something, I think, whether it's creating an object, creating a book, something beyond the very specific narrative that you're asked to do. Right. Are we on to another question? Or are we still <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go back a little bit to photography because um, I'm in the midst of reading um, your book, your e-book. 
Um, and so it's, it's sort of st it's sticking with me. But I'm also, when I looked at some of your work, Chad, um, and how your architecture frames the landscape, and you talk about sort of how um, that's important um, in framing um, certain views. Um, and so we can get into the topic of nature now, which everyone I know, to, know wanted to talk about. So how does that, um, how does that um, you know, impact what you think about nature? What is, um, why, are you, why are you framing nature in that kind of way? Yeah. Glad we got to the nature subject. Um, you know, I, I was just at a site the other day in uh, Telluride, Colorado, and I, strangely enough, did my thesis project at Cornell in Telluride. And uh, I, as I often do when I go to a site. Planning and design. And in the 70s, we were designing ecologically sensitive um, resorts and new towns. And here I was living in Philadelphia, looking at the city crumble around me. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to write my first book, The Granite Garden, Urban Nature and Human Design, to persuade people that the city is part of the natural world. Natural processes don't stop operating at city limits. And that if we just thought of the city as part of the natural world, how di differently we would design it. And um, so that was uh, my first book. It came out in 1984. And I think in terms of uh, nature as processes, uh, physical, chemical, uh, geological processes, that sustain human life and that interact with human, social, economic, political, and economic processes, uh, cultural processes. So um, for me, these processes interacting together create landscape. And for me also, landscape includes buildings. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, so a lot of my work is aimed at not only rebuilding inner city neighborhoods where we have many in Philadelphia, thousands of acres of vacant land, um, in ways that not only sustain human life and rebuild human com communities, but also improve and restore the natural environment. And uh, through my photography and through design proposals that I describe in words in my books, I aim to uh, give people a sense of feeling as well as seeing natural processes and the interplay between natural processes and human uh, processes and the human built world. Um, there is this, I think, unfortunate bifurcation now uh, that I hope is changing between the natural world and what is perceived as the artificial world. The fact of the matter is there isn't an acre on this earth that hasn't been touched in some capacity or another. My partner and I, Marion and I, were uh, trained as architects. Our f the first competition we won that was actually uh, allowed us to establish a practice was a park. It was a very modest community park outside of Chicago that was often inundated when there were uh, storms. So we realized the role of architecture and the role of landscape were unfortunately uh, administratively uh, divided in ways that uh, precluded real opportunities of either social engagement or ecological engagement. And I think the, that kind of bifurcation is starting to shift, but for us it was never a question of saying, oh, is it natural or is it artificial? I think the world now is so intertwined that we have to recognize natural processes and artificial processes are completely uh, synchronized. And uh, that's the only way to start some of the kind of ecological challenges that we seem to be incapable of addressing. And I'm curious in terms of, as you've kind of, um, you know, with, with the work that you do, and if kind of this interaction, whether you're an architect, interaction with, with nature or, um, uh, you know, has brought about sort of certain types of collaborations. Um, as you, I mean, Michael, your practice is architecture. You, you don't want to marginalize any one particular profession. So 
how have the collaborations gone? Um, have you found yourselves in interesting collaborations that probably, if you had not allowed yourself to expand a little bit, um, would, you wouldn't have experienced? Um, talk about some of those. Yeah. Um, collaborations are always fraught. But when you have a, a group of people who uh, mutually respect each other, and understand each other's strengths, because I think the other danger is to sort of say, well, I'm such a generalist that I can't do anything. I think you want to assemble a team and work with folks who really have a body of knowledge. So there's a, a handful of ecologists that we've worked with over the last 10, 15 years. There's a handful of structural engineers that we've worked with, civil engineers. And you try, I think, in a way to work with the folks that you, A, love staying up late at night with and, and uh, you know, uh, agonizing together about how to how to make a better th better place, but you also realize that they bring something that you don't, and it's both humbling, but also inspiring. So uh, I can think of uh, someone like Steve Handel, who's a, an ecologist who is always pushing us to think beyond a kind of limits of a site to see larger patterns. I think you probably know Steve. Um, or there are structural engineers who always remind us that materials do have limits, and we make models with very, very thin surfaces that somehow will span 50, 60 feet. But there's something very beautiful, and I think actually comes back to your work. Um, sometimes those kinds of experts um, enrich our life by making a kind of a, a, bringing us closer to the material presence that we have to deal with. You know, I think what's interesting is that, you know, people think, like, your name's on the door, our name's on the door, that it's an individual working at their desk somehow, but it's, there's so much collaboration, and I, I always think that it's, it's very much a team sport. Um, so there's not only like the collaboration outside the office, but the team that goes into, I mean, you were talking about the embassy, how many people working uh, on the project. There's so many people that go into working on the project, and some of them are in your office, and others are out. Even today with uh, visualization, computer vision, we work with companies all over, like we're working on one project right now where we have three different visualization companies, like all like, throughout Europe who are helping us because just of the size of this project. But you know, the engineers, uh, every, everything has become so specialized. I mean, even on like a small project, like a house, we might have like 15 different consultants from acoustical consultants to landscape architects to uh, you know, mechanical engineering and um, lighting consult. I mean, everything has become so specialized that you need to, an expert to be engaged in all this. And uh, I think it's just very interesting too. Is that me again? <laughs> I'm like the vortex of sound. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, just the idea that it is so involved and so complex and, and, and you just need a team to even organize all the consultants. And, uh, and it, it's really, when you're not in the field, it's kind of hard to fathom how much it takes to actually do even the simplest, smallest project. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's kind of daunting from our side. Yeah. Yeah, just to, I actually want to add one thought, and I know uh, Anne might comment on it. Um, the strongest voices are often the, often the community, and they aren't engineers or ecologists, but they have uh, um, a body of knowledge that's always surprising, and uh, they're the kind of hidden client that we all must we must respond to. Yeah, I, I would say I've been enriched by admitting, admitting is not the, welcoming uh, the people I work with um, into my research. Because uh, ultimately what I'm doing is design experiments I'm, and, and my ultimate product is a book. Um, but it's also a product that I, products that along the way I produce with people in these neighborhoods that I've been working in for 30 years. And so these folks, some of my collaborators, I have literally been working with for mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years. Um, and o over time, uh, I've learned a tremendous amount from them. But I don't want to forget my research assistants, because uh, 
uh, my project, my 30-year action research project, the West Philadelphia Landscape Project, has been shaped by my research assistants. I, we have had since um, 1995, we put our first website together. And uh, um, that was because I had a research assistant who uh, introduced me to the web. And, and he was coding HTML at that point. And I said, I want one of those. I saw his website. I want one of those for the West Philadelphia Landscape Project. Every research assistant who comes on the job adds something of themselves, their own passions and interests. I try to match their passions, interests, and skills to some direction that, because of their participation, the project can move in that direction. Because by myself, I can't, I can't, I can't move it. And um, I've had the, I have just had the fortune to have some wonderful web developers uh, working on the project over time. And um, that's just one example. I mean, there, there are d various different expertise that my, our, my research assistants bring to the project. So I don't want to forget them. But um, there are discoveries I have made on the ground um, that I never would have made if I hadn't been collaborating with people in, in the neighborhood. And uh, I'll give you an example that's really wonderful. So I, you may guess from my previous comment, I'm interested in, I discovered a correlation between vacant urban land in inner city neighborhoods and, um, and buried streams. The, the, the former floodplains of buried streams that are now encased in sewers. And so uh, I started working with this group, the Mill Creek Coalition in West Philly, and this was my entree into basements to actually be able to test, to, to, to research. Um, my, my theory was that as you got further down into the valley bottom, you'd find more flooding in the basements. But how would I ever get to go into the basements in this low-income, virtually all African-American community? And so I, I partnered with the Mill Creek Coalition, no problem. They leafleted the area. We decided we were how we were going to do this uh, pilot research study. And the president of the Mill Creek Coalition said, we have to do my block. It's on the buried floodplain. And I said, well, no, it's not. And she said, yes, it is. I know it is because we have terrible flooding problems. And I'm thinking, well, no, it's not. It's actually upland. Uh, but I said, OK, we'll, we'll do your block. And I was thinking to myself, control block, right, the control. Well, where do you think we found the most damage from water? On her block. And it wasn't from a buried river. It was from uh, problems with site drainage and roof drainage. And I discovered in the process of going on her block and talking to people uh, that actually this is a problem that is prevalent across the city in lower income neighborhoods where um, uh, home maintenance, you know, how the maintenance of the house just hasn't been there and where the original development wasn't well done in terms of site drainage. And uh, last week I was in Philly in the same kind of situation, helping somebody look at their drainage problem because they were on an upland. They weren't. They thought they were on the Mill Creek, and they weren't. And I said, "Well, you know, let's go take a look because this was this other project was 20 years ago." I said, "But you know, I found in the past that it's often due to site drainage." Well, guess what? The city had come, and uh, through a program of helping seniors, low-income seniors, with home repair, had repaired her roof. But they'd taken the downspout, disconnected it from uh, the sewer intake, and had let the downspout come right to the corner of her foundation. And so oh she was God. getting all the water from the roof right down into her basement. Um, so this is an example of a discovery I made only through my collaboration with the neighborhood. And what I've learned through 30 years of working in these neighborhoods in West Philly is no neighbor, no community, however seemingly poor financially, is without resources. Mm -hmm. Every community has a wealth of resources. And you just have to find them as a designer and collaborate with them. And they will lead you to new insights and new realizations and to better design. Yeah. That's great. 
Collaboration. <laughs> well, um, you know, our, our uh, Blue Dot was, uh, we, we started as a collaborative, really, three, three right. founders are, are three designers, and, and, you know, from our earliest designs, we, we rolled a long sheet of butcher paper out over a table and, and, and sat there and, and sketched, basically, and, and, you know, drew over each, each other's ideas um, and, and designed as a group. Um, some ideas might have started in, in my sketchbook or Maurice's sketchbook, but by the end, they were, it was hard to identify sometimes whose design they were. So um, just for that reason, we never put our individual names on any of our, any of our designs from, from the earliest days, and we still don't, even though our design team now is, is bigger. Um, there's, a, there's still Maurice and I are kind of leading that effort, but uh, we have uh, five other designers and they're, you know, coming from various fields. So some from specifically furniture design, some from industrial design, um, some from architecture. Um, my background was a, a sculptor, so um, I had no formal design training, but um, so yeah, it's been a collaboration and, and extends outside of the office as well. It's a collaboration with our suppliers, so we might think something is makeable um, and discover that it's not makeable, but you know, sort of working through that process with with the with the our manufacturing partners, we sometimes or often hopefully come out with a better solution in the end. Is, but it can be a painful process yeah. to get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to before I throw it open to the audience. Um, I wanted to just talk about um, one thing that Michael and Anne and I talked about a little bit, which was, um, and you and you were beginning to get to it, Michael, about this um, about the community garden which Anne talked about um, in terms of kind of looking at something really small, whether it's a you know, kind of piece of furniture or a community garden in your instance, and how that can be kind of a, um, a model in a, um, in a small way for something much larger, for a, a much larger discussion. So like the community garden you talked about was probably the biggest lesson for you in terms of urban design. Um, and and I'm just curious, I want you to kind of elaborate a little bit on that and um, if there are other examples where, that you've come across in your own work where that kind of small, um, what you thought humble kind of project really kind of opened up to something, to a larger kind of conversation um, with, you know, whether it's with outside people, with yourself. Um, so... I started working, is this working? Yes. Yeah. I started working with um, communities in West Philadelphia in 1987, working on community, designing community gardens. And as you said, a seemingly humble task, but it brought us into contact, into contact with the most incredible people. Most of them uh, senior, seniors, um, in these, uh, in these neighborhoods. And one of the, uh, uh, we were doing designs for community gardens, not only as, uh, with my research assistants, but also with, um, with my studios. I would use a two week sketch problem, short problem, to design the community garden as an introduction to the neighborhood and to the people in the neighborhood uh, in order to go on then and do grander visions. And, uh, this one project that my studio did in 1988 for Aspen Farms Community Garden, a community garden that had been founded in 1976, a community garden of 50 gardeners um, already existing, but they wanted and had won many prizes at the annual harvest show um, for Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, but they wanted a meeting place and how do you, this is an urban design problem, right? How do you take an existing community and insert a new use in an area which is fully occupied, right? The garden's divided up into 50 plots. So uh, my students took on this project and as kind of, um, I would say not typical designers, but as beginning designers, they had the precedence in mind of a meeting place, like a plaza, piazza, mm -hmm. a circle, or a square, and in the center. And of course, they, they all but one put the, right in the center, either circle or square. One student put a circle at the corner 
of the street so that people could look in from the street and see it. Um, and, but one of my students actually took his design out to the gardeners two days before the final review and showed the, his design to the gardeners. And they said, they looked at it and they said, well, this is all very nice, but actually your design's a disaster. <laughs> you have totally destroyed Mrs. Williams' group, right? So it turned out that this lovely community we all thought about was actually a, a community of, well, warring factions is probably too strong a word, but let's say factions. Differences. Differences, different groups, some of whom didn't really speak to each other. And we had idealized this community. So the students had basically all destroyed Mrs. Williams' group. Mrs. Williams was the founder of one of the founders of the garden. John Widrick, this student thought, went home and thought, hmm, okay, well, he'd been working with me as a research assistant on my book, The Language of Landscape. And he thought a little bit further about decoding a meeting place. And he said, well, a path is also a meeting place. And there's currently a main path down the center of the garden that's slightly wider. What if I just shaved off a few couple feet from each side of the main path so that a whole bunch of plots lost a little bit and then created, um, he had gotten them to identify where the different groups were and then designed um, planter boxes and gateways to each of these groups off the main path so that to solve the problem of the tragedy of the commons who cares for the common space, using their competitiveness to see who would have the best looking planter boxes outside their group's territory. Well, in this process, they all learned and I learned that uh, communities are quite complex. And as the president Hayward Ford said, um, this garden is a town. We have everything but a penal colony. <laughs> We have the garbage, we have the compost pile, we have the infrastructure, we have the paths and streets, we have the, we have the irrigation system, the water lines. Uh, so we're really like a town. And this was turned out to be the perfect introduction to then scaling up and thinking about a larger neighborhood and how to design within a larger neighborhood. Hayward Ford also said, we have 50 different gardeners and 50 different ways of doing things and seeing things. It's not all a bed of roses. It's 50 beds of roses. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so things that may seem humble uh, are, are actually can be uh, quite extraordinary uh, places of learning where you can take the insights and apply them to a uh, much grander scale. I'm sure you probably find that also with the work you guys did. Really? No, no, no. I think it's uh, no. Well, no. I'm just in terms of you know, um, you know, the kinds of um, you know whether it's just kind of how furniture is assembled or packed, or um, it can it can lead to kind of bigger discussions about you know how we um, you know how how furniture should be designed, how it should be transported. I mean, it's all about economics, that kind of. So I don't know. I mean, it's it can be. I think there are a lot of ways that it could be interpreted, in terms of you know that kind of humble humble lesson. Yeah. Um, I, maybe I'll. Sorry. Do I have your microphone, Chad? No. no? Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I'm not sure this is relevant, but I can tell a story of how uh, this sort of inspiration for one of our maybe more well-known designs, which is called the Real Good Chair. Um, which packs flat uh, and in sort of an oversized pizza carton, and that's really an economic, you know, it's an economic uh, decision because our, our mission was to try and make good design more affordable, which for us starts at the very, you know, with the very first sketch and, and works its way all through, you know, throughout the entire system. Um, so we were sitting around and trying to figure out how could we, how could we make a three-dimensional object out of steel that could, um, that could ship flat and be put together by consumer and we were eating pizza and late at night and um, pizza boxes of the you know obviously they ship flat and then they're folded together and they're the edges are perforated um, the little dashes to make the folding easy so 
um, we started thinking, like, what if, you know, could we do that with steel? Could you perforate steel and leave little, little rectangular perforations and leave little connective tissue so that they could ship flat, be folded, but still be stiff enough to, you know, hold you up? Um, and that was the beginning of experimenting with, 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 with that um, until we got kind of the right pattern uh, so that it would be, um, so it would do both of those things. And um, actually, it started not with the chair so much. It started, started even sooner with some little desk accessories and smaller, smaller objects, which were, when you make them traditionally out of many parts with fasteners and you're putting them together, for us, by the time we did that and priced them out and then put on the retailer's markup, they ended up being too expensive. So, like, is there a simpler way to do this with one material? Um, and um, so, yeah, sort of a humble, a pizza box, a, a pizza box yeah. Can I, can I just to build on this because I think that um, what you're doing is really important, uh, which to me is uh, who, gets, who gets the products of design? You know, who benefits from design? And uh, you're reaching out, your, your ambition is to bring design with good, good design, high quality design within reach of ordinary people. And I think that that's a major challenge to us as designers is how do we bring good design into uh, the homes, the communities of people who um, can't, might not, can't, can't afford high design maybe, or don't think they can, or don't even know that they need design, or that it can help them in any way. Yeah, and there's also, I, I think, um, Chad mentioned this, but I think the capacity of design to remind ourselves about our bodies, our bodies in space, what we touch, what we feel good about, and uh, particularly in this increased digitized world, the kind of haptic realm is something that we really need to recover. I'll just tell one short story and then we can pass it on, I think. Um, speaking of the power of design and who the constituency is, I had mentioned this story to uh, Matilda and Anne, on our Hunter's Point project, we had a number of community meetings, many community meetings, and presented designs. And at one point, we were presenting design, and we were talking about the Olmsteadian landscape. And then we were talking about flows and recovering lost ecologies and the multiple histories. And, and it was a really interesting conversation. You could just look out in the audience where everybody was falling asleep. It was late at night. And then we started to describe the project, and we said, well, in addition to all the things we've heard, we understand that you guys are really interested in a dog run, which we thought was like the least important thing after these incredible concepts of democracy and socialization. Everybody perked up. And we quickly discovered, talk about kind of community engagement, that there was one group, one end of the room, that were small dog lovers, small dog owners. You probably know this. There was another group that were large dog owners. And then there was a third group that were like, well, we are, it's not about size, it's about temperament, and our dogs are gentle. So somehow we had, through design, and this is where everybody perked up, and it was an epiphany. We came back with a series of models and drawings to show how this dog run could help resolve these <laughs> inseparable differences in the community, and I'm particularly proud of the fact that everybody enters one gate, big dogs, small dogs, sweet dogs, aggressive dogs, and then they all go into their own precincts, which they, they their own territories, which they uh, are jealous about. And in a way, it was humbling, because if those dogs are happy, their owners are happy, and we're happy. Anybody else want to, yeah, go ahead, Chad. Yeah, no, I, I was just thinking about the idea of the community garden, and we, we brought a project to fruition where um, Audi was actually coming to Miami to um, celebrate what they do for the city, and uh, they asked us if they can do an event at one of our projects, and we said yes, but we want you guys to actually do something for the city, so we worked with the mayor of Miami, and got Audi to actually donate an entire park. And uh, we had done all our work pro bono. And it, what was fascinating was the mayor was like, hey, there's this piece of land that's actually the only native habitat left in the city of Miami. 
and it was a little park that was abandoned. And uh, it's kind of strange to think like this little, you know, 500 by 500 feet swath of land is the last remaining piece of the native ecosystem. And it, it was a closed park. So we're able to um, have that raise all the money and finance uh, the project with Audi to re-inhabit this, this park. And we designed an incredible gateway. Uh, but speaking about municipalities, I, was, I was just drove by the other day and the whole park is like abandoned. It's mm -hmm. like, like we, it was hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that we raised oh and the city just let it go down. So one of the things that we think a lot about is, is the maintenance. And it wasn't really a land, it was a native hammock like an oak yeah. hammock and uh but it's fascinating like when you do build these parks and i'm sure you deal with it and someone was just talking to me about getting involved in this underline project which is kind of like the high line but in right. miami it's uh, right. under underline. the the railroad um elevated railroad and i was saying like they raised all this money but i'm like i hope you have a lot of money for the the maintenance yeah. of these yeah. types of urban projects because it, it really it's almost more money goes into the maintenance of it than the actual construction. Maintenance needs to be part of the design. Yeah. I make that when I teach studio uh, and the students are doing landscape design. The idea is that the design starts with building support for the project, how it gets built, which is, goes to your, your point and your points, um, and then how it gets maintained over time. Uh, that if designers don't think about maintenance, particularly landscape architects, we're in trouble. Those do a good job. Yeah, yeah. So well, it's, a, it's also true for architecture, and we all think that architecture is permanent. It's not. It's being changed every day by people who move furniture, who uh, turn lights on and off, and the kind of flux is something that is uh, crucial. And if someone doesn't love what uh, we help uh, help them with, uh, whether it's a park or a chair, then I think we've really failed. I think we've run out of time. We have a time for maybe a couple of questions. Um, anyone have any questions in the audience? Playgrounds. And we're talking about community and we're talking about the importance of nature and educating young people, I think, is particularly important. And I'm wondering if that is a lost art. Have we not continued that concept? Is it gone? Do you know what I'm talking about in Berkeley, Absolutely California? what you're talking about, the, and it's, uh, it's a growing movement. Yeah. Uh, it's not gone at all. I would say, yeah, she started something, and it's, it's going strong. Are you, going in, uh, are you doing it in Philadelphia? Yes. Excellent. Um, I'm interested from all of you, how do you address the needs for inclusive design, especially for people with disabilities, into the work that you're doing with the built environment? Because I know especially for landscaping, that can be quite challenging. Uh, it's absolutely crucial. And um, I think almost everything we touch now uh, by law has to, but I think there's a, a point where you have to go uh, farther. We're doing a very small project, a crate myrtle garden for the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, and it actually turns out that there's a large constituency of parents who are also pushing strollers who suddenly realize getting from point A to point B has to be both uh, doable but pleasurable. And I think that's what we tend to forget when we look at legislation. It's not just the letter of the law, but making it a really a pleasurable experience. So there isn't a distinction. All right, well, thank you very much to all of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming.